Hello and welcome. My name is Jenny Florence. Thank you for reading my articles and for those of you that are following me, thank you very much indeed for promoting emotional health. There is so much that we can do to create a shift in the well-being of humanity and our emotional health is right at the core of this. If you're interested in listening to more audios about emotional health, do please access my website. The details are always at the bottom of my blogs. This audio talk today is an extract from my audiobook, Emotional Health, The Voice of Our Soul. So let's talk about the difference between living and surviving. Over the course of my therapeutic work, I have come across many, many people who are managing life, coping with life, sort of muddling through, they get by, but they're not living, they're not thriving, and they're not flourishing. I've also met many people who are in a state of crisis. They come to see me at a point in their lives when they're no longer able to manage or to cope. Muddling through isn't working anymore. Not only are they not thriving and not flourishing, but things are seriously not working. Things are breaking down. In fact, I would say that a large part of my work has been to enable people to move from a position of breakdown to a position of breakthrough. Interestingly enough, sometimes it takes something very traumatic and something very difficult to really cause us to wake up and to take a good look at the way that we're engaging with our lives, to begin to notice and to really think about the quality of our daily lives. What do people mean when they talk about quality of life? They're actually talking about the way that they feel. They're talking about their emotions. What do people mean when they talk about quality time? They're talking about the emotional quality of the time that they spend with someone. Or indeed, if it's me time, it's about the emotional quality of the time that they have with themselves. In everything that we do and in every moment of our lives, we're in a state of experience. And the quality of that experience, whether it's fabulous or challenging, is defined by the way that we feel. It's defined by our emotions. Right at the core of our sense of well being, right at the core of our health, are our emotions, our feelings. The way that we're feeling tells us whether or not we're okay. And yet for most people, the relationship that they have with their emotions and with their deeper inner feelings is often very limited. And it's very rarely at the top of their agenda. Their emotional well-being is not considered a priority. Our emotions are our navigational system. Our emotions are driving us and they're steering us. They're actually giving us information all of the time, and yet we frequently don't listen to this information. Sometimes we've actually learned not to listen. And sometimes we simply haven't learned how to. Sometimes our emotional experiences have been so difficult and so traumatic that we've developed ways of avoiding the way that we feel at all costs. Our emotions are actually intertwined into the very fabric of our being at all levels. When we feel something emotionally, we feel that emotion physically. We feel it in our body. When we feel something emotionally, it triggers thoughts. And thoughts are generated from feelings. And indeed, feelings are generated from thoughts. They're connected. Our emotions connect us to our deepest yearnings. They connect us to our deepest and most fundamental needs. They connect us to our deepest and most fundamental desires. They let us know when life is working for us. And they also tell us when something is wrong. Emotions are relational. They form the link between everything that's going on in our inner self, in our internal world, all of our internal experiences. And they also form the link between everything that we feel externally everything that we experience externally in the larger world around us, whether that's relationships to other people 
all our relationship to circumstances and to things that are going on around us. Our emotions form the connection between all elements of ourselves and all aspects of our lives, both inner and outer. They are the absolute expression of relatedness and of relationship. They give voice to the exchange of everything that is taking place in our pure and real experience. In the first audio of this series, I said that emotions have a fluid relationship to time. And I'll say more about this in a moment. But for now, let's just think about the idea that emotions are actually fluid. And by fluid, I don't mean that they're made of liquid. What I mean is that they are in a continual state of movement. They flow and they interconnect. They're designed to be that way. So let's think about the difference between living and surviving. What makes that difference? I said a moment ago that our emotions are our navigational system. As adults, in order to live a flourishing and fulfilling life, it's essential that we develop a healthy relationship to what we feel. And to do this, we must be able to listen to our feelings, to listen to our emotions, and to use this information to inform us. When we're children, it's different. We are completely reliant upon our grown-ups to listen to our feelings with us and for us. We need people around us to help us to engage with what we feel and to help us to understand our emotions. Human beings are 100% relational and our emotions are the relational link that continually informs us. This is how we learn and this is how we grow. And yet the reality is that many people don't know how to engage or relate to what they're actually feeling. Many people struggle to even identify the different emotions that they feel. They haven't learned any kind of language that will allow them to listen to themselves and to interpret what they're feeling appropriately. Now, this isn't because during their childhood, their grown-ups didn't want to teach them this language. It isn't because their grown-ups set out to get this wrong. It's simply that they weren't well equipped themselves. They didn't have the tools themselves and therefore couldn't pass them on to their own children. If we haven't inherited a language, an emotional language, then we'll be unable to pass it on to the next generation. When we don't understand what we're feeling, if we find ourselves experiencing something that actually feels intolerable or something that feels unbearable, if we're alone with these feelings, if we have no way of processing them or understanding them, if we have no validation or reassurance that what we're feeling is okay, then we can easily become frightened of our emotions, frightened of experiencing any of the more challenging or difficult feelings that we have. In reality, if something dreadful is going on and you're having an intense emotional response to that, your feelings are actually very appropriate. They may be very difficult feelings and they may be acutely challenging feelings, but they're actually an appropriate response to something that isn't okay. When difficult, painful and traumatic experiences happen, particularly during our childhood, if we don't have the support that we need to understand what we're feeling, or we're simply too young to be able to make any sense of what's happening to us, then we develop all kinds of complex systems to enable us to cope with the intense emotional overload. Now, one of the problems that results from these kind of systems is that we frequently end up shutting something of ourselves down. We become frightened of the way that we feel. And in order to manage these feelings and to cope, with any kind of intense emotional overload, we find ways to distance ourselves from these difficult and often distressing feelings. In reality, whatever you were feeling, it was actually a natural response to something that wasn't okay. So it was actually giving you good information. When we experience something 
that is intensely painful. The intensity of our emotions will be relational to the situation. The intensity will be relative to the actual experience that took place. So it's not surprising that if we find ourselves in a traumatic and painful situation, that we will develop ways to try to alleviate our distress, to alleviate our emotional overload. We need to find a way of handling this. Any system that we develop internally that shuts something down or distances us from our own feelings, from our extraordinary navigational system, will inevitably be driven by fear. Any fear-driven emotional system will end up being self-perpetuating, an ever-increasing spiral, fueling the kind of habitual thinking that I spoke about in the last audio, the what-if type of thinking, the repetitive thought syndrome, the ways in which we overlay a current situation with a past perception. Fear generates more fear. It heightens our anxiety. If we're living with an underlying degree of anxiety or fear, we'll be living on high alert. And when we live on high alert, we constantly look for things that might go wrong. And sometimes we perceive things to be way more threatening than they actually are. We anticipate crisis, catastrophe and disaster. Fear alters our perception. It alters our interpretation of the things that are going on around us and it alters the way in which we engage in all of our relationships, not only to the people and the circumstances around us, but also to our relationship with ourselves. Fear oriented systems are self-fulfilling prophecies. If we're anticipating a difficult response, we can quite unknowingly behave in a way that generates the very response that we're afraid of. And this reinforces any deep-seated beliefs that the world is a threatening and an unsafe place. The position of fear maintains itself. fear oriented systems are emotionally disabling and they keep us stuck. In reality, all of our emotions are vital to us, even fear. If we had no fear at all, we wouldn't know when to move ourselves out of a dangerous situation. Our navigational system would be missing a vital component. We won't be able to take care of ourselves. If we think about our emotions as core, pure components, pure elements, we can begin to see how incredibly important they all are to us. To be able to live well, to be able to flourish, to be able to navigate our world at our best, we need the full range. I've just spoken about fear and what a vital and healthy element it is in our ability to take care of ourselves. Let's think about some of the other emotions that tend to get a really bad press. Let's think about guilt. When someone is overloaded with guilt, it can be incredibly self-persecutory and utterly disabling. And yet if we had no guilt at all, we'd have no conscience. We wouldn't have the ability to be empathic, to care about and be considerate of others. At its best, this is an incredibly valuable emotion. Our problems with guilt tend to develop when it's either misplaced or misused. Guilt can be used as a kind of weapon, as a tool for manipulation. And when this happens, people get hurt. They hurt themselves, or they hurt others, or both. Anger and aggression are another interesting emotion to think about. We almost always associate the word aggression as being bad or negative. At its worst, aggression is about hatred and violence and abuse about the misuse of power. However, at its best, the very same pure emotional component, the same emotional driver gives us motivation, assertiveness, passion, pride, ambition. 
When we shut down one of our emotions, when we try to distance ourselves from something that we don't want to feel, whilst we may manage to suppress the bits that we don't want, the chances are that we also suppress some of the bits that we do want, some of the bits we need. As human beings, we're actually rubbish at being selective in this way. When we try to shut down one kind of feeling, we inevitably shut down something else that we really do need in order to be healthy and vibrant, in order to flourish in life. Interestingly, many people who suffer from certain types of depression struggle to have an ownership of anger. They haven't learned how to express this emotion within themselves in a way that feels healthy and safe. And the result is they suffer with underlying levels of anxiety. They experience exhaustion and they struggle to feel motivated. They struggle to feel alive. A vital component is missing. When we have a difficult and unhealthy relationship with any of our emotions, when we develop complex systems in order to cope with our anxiety about the way that we feel, we're shutting down the natural flow of life. We're shutting down our very vitality. Remember, our emotions interweave and form a relationship that links every aspect of our very being. Our emotions are a picture of our deepest experiences. If your emotions are telling you that something isn't okay, it's a valid communication. It's the voice of pure experience. This may be challenging. It may be difficult, but it's actually informing you. Something in us is crying out to be heard. Something in us needs us to listen and something in us needs us to respond. If we learn to shut down our emotions, we shut down our capacity to be fully relational. We shut down our capacity to be relational and to communicate fully with ourselves. We also shut down our capacity to be fully relational and available to the world that we're continually engaging in. And in doing so, we shut down and distance ourselves from the very things that we need. You know that pretty much all of the difficulties that we encounter in life that are emotionally driven are actually an attempt to find a solution to a problem. These kind of shutting down systems that I'm talking about are actually all about self-preservation and about keeping safe. They're a misdirected or misguided form of self-care. Self-care and self-defense are not the same thing, but they get muddled up. Self-care is about generating health and well-being. It comes from a responsive position. It's about living. Self-defense is about protection and generating safety. It comes from a reactive position. It's about surviving. Sometimes the very things that we've put in place to protect us, things that have served us very well for a period of time, then become the very thing that's in our way, the very thing that's blocking us and stopping us from moving forwards in life. The solution to the problem has become the problem. When we shut ourselves down emotionally, we're unable to listen to ourselves and unable to hear. We become closed to possibility and therefore closed to change and to resolution. When we shut down possibility, we shut down hope. We are no longer living, we're surviving. I said earlier that our emotions have a fluid relationship to time. Our mind has a perception of time, but our emotions do not. Just as they interweave through every aspect of ourselves, they also interweave through every aspect of our history. If you think about it, we can see, hear, smell or taste something, and it can take us straight back to a previous place in time. And this isn't just a thinking memory. We can literally revisit an experience, both remembering it in our mind and re-feeling it in the way that we did at that previous time. Our emotions fluidly link all of our life experiences. 
Remember, they are the absolute expression of relationship. They are the relational connection between all aspects of our very being. And this includes our history. Imagine your life as a timeline with all your emotions in a continual relationship to all your experiences. Your emotional well-being will be relational to the quality of the relationship that you have with yourself. And this includes the relationship that you have with your past experiences. Systems of survival are always connected to past experience, to past situations. Systems of survival are actually an incredibly creative enterprise. And this should always be recognized and always appreciated. We actually develop the most extraordinary life skills through self-protection. However, once we grow up, if our creativity is tied into survival, then we'll be investing energy in maintaining past experiences that were difficult, rather than investing our energy fully into current experiences in the present time. When this happens, we're not available to grow there is no learning curve taking place. We're managing something from the past rather than growing from something in our past. Remember in the last audio, I spoke about the kind of thinking that whilst incredibly active and in a state of perpetual motion is actually paradoxically static. It's limiting natural growth and movement and going around in circles. When creativity is invested in surviving rather than living, our emotional growth is being limited. It is being stifled. We're losing our emotional voice and therefore our capacity to engage fully in a rich and flourishing life. Human beings are 100% relational and we're emotionally driven. To live fully and to be in charge of our own actions in life, we need to be emotionally available to ourselves. Whether we are living or surviving is a reflection of the quality of the relationship we have with our emotions, the openness of that relationship. The difference between surviving and thriving is relative to our ability to listen and to be responsive to our deepest inner needs. And to do this, we need to have an entire emotional experience available to us right now. In the next audio, I'm going to talk more about our extraordinary navigational system. Thank you and take care. This is copyrighted material 2014. Jenny Burgess, the A to Z of Emotional Health. All rights reserved.